Hey, okay. Hey, welcome back from her break. I want to jump right into chapter uh, 18. And uh, 18, as you'll see, can go pretty quick because it's a lot like we just did. There's a... Uh, uh, Things that are a lot the same. Of course, there's some new things too, so I don't want to go too quickly, but I want to make sure we can finish up here 18, and I think you'll see the connection between 17 and 18 uh, really well. I'll also apologize here at the beginning. Uh, as I said, we've got a lot of challenges today because we had a massive flood, and they're turning the power on and off, the water on and off, and we've got some workers. So uh, we've been warned that we might have to stop and then start again later. So the videos might come in multiple pieces or choppy, but we're, we're going to make the best of what we can. And so we'll, we'll see where this goes. But we'll eventually get it to you. And I'm trying to get it to you as soon as I can because uh, the, you know, the, 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 the time is short here. And I want you to have it as soon as you can so that you'll be ready for the exam tomorrow. So let me jump right in here and uh, point out here what chapter 18 is all about. And just like in 17, I said 17 was all based upon the law of reflection. This is all based upon the law of refraction. And so let's talk about the refraction of light. Now, refraction is not a very common word like reflection. So maybe I should define it as well as show you here in a second. But here is the refraction of light. Uh, let me define it this way. It's the bending of light uh, that occurs at the surface, and I'm going to emphasize that, where, where the bending occurs. So it occurs at the surface or the transition as it goes from one transparent object into another. And so if you haven't uh, seen refraction, it wouldn't surprise me. We don't usually see beams of light. We usually only see the light when it gets to our, our eyes. But I want to convince you here at the start, what, what is this thing called refraction? And it really is this bending of light. It's why I've got these pieces of clear uh, glass here. And so light can travel through the air, but it can also travel through glass. It can also travel through water. And so watch what happens when it goes from air into the glass, or for that matter, out of the glass into the air at the at the surface, at the, at the boundary. And so I'll power down the chalkboard lights here. Uh, maybe for simplicity, I'll just block all but one of the red laser beams up here. And if I put this glass block up here, I'm hoping you are able to see on the, the video camera this transition zone here. In fact, why don't I go ahead and draw kind of a dotted line where this red beam is going right now when there is no transition from one medium to another. Because if I were to put this glass block right there, I think you will see that as it goes into the glass block, it bends. Oh, for that matter, as it comes out of the glass block, it also bends. In fact, notice that it bends the opposite coming out that it went in. And eventually it ends up, in this case, going in the same direction. Now that's not to say it will always happen that way. It will always happen that way if a certain conditions are met. Um, and these conditions are met. But if I did this right here, maybe I'll show that to you. You'll see that as the light enters, there's this bending going on. As it exits, there's a little bit of bending, not much. I tried to set it up so that there'd be very little to no bending coming out. Because I want to focus my first attention and your first attention to the light going into the glass. But once we understand going into the glass, I think we will also understand coming out of the glass. In either case, I want to convince you that the light does bend. When it goes from one medium to another medium, it does bend. Now, more on this in just a second, because the first question I think is to ask is, why does it do this bending? 
And so why does it bend? Well, maybe I should put the question mark there. And the answer to that has to do with the speed of light. If you remember before we took our break, which was a little longer than we anticipated, like I said, we're having a lot of challenges in our building here today. But now that we're back here and doing some more uh, filming, and we'll probably have to take a break before we can finish this, uh, the because I, I can hear the workers outside cleaning up here and getting ready for our room. Uh, but the speed of light is affected by molecules in the air. Do you remember before the break I said what is the speed of light and I put underneath it in a vacuum. And I put a number here of roughly 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But I tried to emphasize that this is the speed in a vacuum and I want to say that again. Now since we're going to use this number a lot, let's give it its own unique symbol. And so kind of the, the universal symbol for the speed of light is the lowercase c. All right. So let's just say the speed of light is this, this number c, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, a very, a very big number. Maybe I'll draw a picture of a light wave. Uh, in fact, just to kind of put it together with last chapter. I could have different wavelengths or different frequencies. So this would be a this would be a high frequency. So maybe this would be my violet light. Uh, this would be a low frequency or a long wavelength. So maybe this would be my red light. But let's just say that it's in air. And so I would say both of these, it doesn't matter what their frequency is, they will be going at this speed. This speed is the speed of light, the speed of light in a vacuum. So this is what these colors would be doing in outer space. And so as they are traveling from the sun to the earth, they're all traveling at the, the same speed. But then when they hit a material such as glass or any transparent material, water, uh, Pyrex, uh, mica, you know, anything where the, 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 the light can travel through it, it would be hitting and interacting with the atoms in that material. And so as they interact, they kind of slow it down. It, it, it's kind of like saying this, you have a walking speed, I have a walking speed. If I walk across the room, I walk at a particular speed. This is my walking speed, I walk across the room. If I go from my office to the mail room, I walk across the room. Oh. Which oh, um, yes, I, uh, Ron's just saying I could draw a better picture, so I will, hang on. Yeah, thank you. I, I should make a better picture. Um, and let me put these back here. Um, but uh, Ron was saying that their wavelengths would get a little shorter. And that's true. Uh, that's not the part I wanted to show you, though. But thank you, Ron. I want to make my picture look uh, correct. Uh, so they will get a little shorter. And maybe I'll mention that along the way here. But what I wanted to mention here as they are interacting, and so as I walk across the room, if, if, if I see an atom or if I see a person, you know, and I stop and I interact some way, uh, that would slow me down. Then I would go to the next atom. Now I would walk just as fast to the next atom, but then I would interact a little bit with it. So the speed of light in the glass is a little confusing because between atom to atom, it's still going the speed of the light in a vacuum, but it does stop and interact. So the overall effect, the average speed in the glass is a little slower by some factor. And so that factor is referred to as the index of refraction. Well, we like to say this then, V equaling, and so V being the speed. So what is the speed of light? Now, not in a vacuum, 
This is what I want to emphasize. See, I already said what's the speed of light in a vacuum. The speed of light in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8. That's the speed that light has when it doesn't interact with anything. But if it interacts with something, like somebody walking through a room, they would go that speed until they interacted. Then they would stop, they would do their interaction, and if it's not long, then they would move on. Maybe they do a little more interaction and then they would move on. But the overall effect, how long did it take them to go from one end of the room to another, would, would give them the appearance of having a slower speed. And that's exactly what happens with, with the light. And so we like to say that the speed of light in a material is then reduced by this factor n called the index of refraction. And if I put some numbers here on the board, it'll give you some kind of idea of how much the light interacts with the different materials. There, there's four of them that I like to put here on the board. You don't have to, you don't need to commit them to memory by any means. But you will have questions on the homework and the test related to them. So note to come back to this chapter during the test and say, okay, what is the index, say, of a vacuum? What is the index of refraction of, say, air? What is the index of refraction of, say, water? And what is the index of, say, glass? And those are kind of the common four to talk about. Uh, your author has a big chart there in chapter 18. But I'll start with, the, I think, the easy one. The easy one is, what would be the index in a vacuum? In fact, maybe it's so easy it's not even necessary to talk about it, kind of boring. Clearly, this is what we mean by the speed in a vacuum. Clearly, it doesn't slow down at all. There are no molecules to interact. And so if you want to divide by something and not change it, you divide by one. So the index of refraction of a vacuum, we usually don't even talk about it. It's just kind of implied. Okay, yeah, I get it. It's one. All right. So that's kind of our starting point. What is the speed of light in a, in a vacuum? But when light goes, say, from the outer space part, as it's traveling from the sun to the earth, the first thing it's going to encounter is the earth's atmosphere. And when it hits the earth's atmosphere, it does have an interaction. Now, not much, and therefore it does not slow down by much, and therefore the index of refraction is not much, because, you know, you, even the air, I mean, you, you can move your hand through it. The, it. It's kind of hard for us to imagine, since we can't really see them, but if we could see the individual atoms in this room, we would have one here. Then that same space, we could go a thousand times before we got to the next atom. So there's a lot of empty space in all of this. Oh, by the way, did we do a sound check? Yeah, we did. Okay. So there's a lot of empty space between atoms or molecules in the air. And so does the light interact? Yes, but very little. And so we would take that speed and divide it by a number that is almost one. Now, water, on the other hand, there's a lot of molecules. And I should emphasize, it's not just how many, but what they are made out of. Okay, but definitely how many when I compare water to air. I mean, you could just move your hand through the air and then try to move your hand through a bucket of water. And just that resistance of how many more molecules, you can just feel that, uh, how many are there. And so there's just a lot more molecules and therefore a lot more interaction. And so light has a harder time, at least on average, going through because it goes a little distance and gets to another molecule and then a little distance and another molecule. And so it's constantly stopping and interacting with this molecule before it goes to the next molecule. And so overall, its effect, its average speed then is a little bit less moving through water. And glass, the same thing. Glass, the, uh, there's so many more molecules and they're also of a different type that interact a little bit more. And so this is the, the effect. And so what I'm trying to say here is that 
the light does bend. And as we'll see here, it's bending because of this change in speed. Now I've yet to show you that, but I'm trying to convince you here at the beginning about this magical number, which we call the index of refraction. It is a measurement of how much does its speed slow as it goes from a vacuum into whatever this transparent material is. Because, watch this for a moment. What if I had air, as shown in that picture, and then I'll just talk about glass. And I have this beam of light, and so maybe I'll make a beam that's about this wide. And so maybe just to kind of show it, I'll kind of draw these vertical lines. Maybe if I was seeing the wave, if you kind of imagine each of these vertical lines would maybe represent where the crest of the wave is. And so as the wave is coming along, if you just hit it square on, like this, not much really happens. Although its wavelength does get smaller. This was the part Ron was wanting me to make sure I drew correctly. Because see what would happen is this first part would enter and it would be going slow as the back part caught up. And so if I was going to kind of draw it on the inside of the glass, I would have to draw the crests closer together. Because in here, it is now going slow, whereas out here, it is now going fast. Or maybe to put another way, mathematically, you would say this. On the outside, wavelength times frequency would equal to C, the speed of light. Uh, inside of the glass, though, it would be wavelength times frequency, and then this would be C over N. Oh, and I guess technically this would be over N. Maybe I should have said here vacuum. There's, like I said, there is a small number for air, but it's so close to one. That's kind of what I was thinking. The big change is not so much when it goes from a vacuum to an air, but the big change is when it goes from the vacuum to the glass or water. Uh, and it's kind of hard to make a vacuum, so it's easy to make an air and water interface. But the point here is this number would dramatically go down, the speed would dramatically go down, or at least in this case, if we're going into glass, it would go down by 50%. And so one of these numbers, and it's not going to be the frequency, it's going to be the wavelength gets a little bit smaller. And of course you see that as it comes in. Now that part your, your author doesn't talk about, and he doesn't talk about the wavelength uh, getting uh, smaller. That was uh, really more for Ron because he was curious to make sure I, 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 I showed that and covered that. What I want you to see is that a beam of light going straight in, and in this case, would continue to go straight through. Watch. I'll go back to my chalkboard. Here is my piece of glass. There's the line that it's going, right? Here's the beam of light coming straight in. It hits the glass and it continues to go straight. There was no bending at all. The part I want to convince you of, the part that is more interesting, is what if you don't hit the glass straight on? What if you hit the glass like this? give me a chance to clear the board and draw a picture and dry it here and so uh, well I'll still make a vertical line between the either the air or the vacuum and then the glass and now I'm going to make a beam So I'll draw some lines, maybe representing the crest. And this is the real key. Did you notice that part of the beam enters the glass before the other? 
And as a result, one edge, and in this case, this edge will slow down before the other edge. And so it's, it's, not, it's not a matter of slowing down as much as it is a slowing down of one side versus the other. Because during the transition, while this end is going slow and this end is going fast, maybe I'll kind of represent it with my arms. If, if, if my arms represent the beam and we're going together at the same speed, and then all of a sudden this side goes slower, then when this side slows down, that, that's going to make this side have to travel a greater distance than this side, and, and that's what an arc is. That's what a curve is. And so during the transition, there is a bending of this. In other words, while this travels a long distance, this only travels a short distance. And I want to emphasize it only occurs in the transition. Once the whole beam gets inside the glass, the whole beam is now traveling slower. Now, it doesn't keep bending, and I'll say it. It's not the slow speed that makes it bend. It's the differential in speed that makes the bend. To me, this kind of sounds like my emphasis on tides. Uh, it wasn't the force of gravity that made the tides. It was the differential in the force of gravity that made the tides. And I'm trying to say the same thing here. It's not the slower speed that makes the bending. It is the differential and you only have the differential while it is entering. And so going back to our definition, and I've since erased it, but you might remember it said right up here, the bending of light during the transition at the surface. And so it is, it is not bending while it is in the glass. It is bending while it is transitioning into the glass. So I, I, I'll, I'll show you again here. I'll, I'll power down the, the light. Whoa, that's a little too much light. Hang on. Uh, let's do the like that. And if I set this at an angle here, you'll see that right here, there is this, this bending. Uh, maybe to make it match that way, maybe I'll do this. Where as it comes in, this upper edge of the light beam hits the glass first. And so this edge hits the, first, the glass first. And so this outer part is still going fast while this inner part is going slow. And so it's that differential in speed that results in the, in the bending. And in fact, I'm kind of hoping this would, would, would help, is I went ahead and I got these wheels here and some rubber bands. I'll start with the rubber bands off because the wheels have the same circumference. They have the same radius, the same diameter, and the same circumference. And so when I roll the wheels, they go straight. And I could roll them fast, they go straight. I can roll them slow, and they go straight. It is not a matter of how fast they go, but when I set this up so that one wheel goes faster than the other, and there's a lot of ways to make one wheel go faster than the other, but the easiest for me to do is to put a couple little rubber bands on them because the rubber bands get, are equivalent of giving it a little longer circumference. And so when this thing spins one time around, this wheel's going to travel a little bit further, hence a little bit faster than that one. And so if I now roll this towards you, you'll see it turns. It turns so that the faster side is on the outside and the slow side is on the inside. And it doesn't matter whether I roll it fast or slow. Oh, well, maybe I better go fast <laughs> and slow. It still turns because again, the turning is not caused by how fast but the differential. In fact, maybe you've been in some kind of paddling, maybe a stand-up paddling board, maybe a kayak, maybe a canoe. 
but the way you need to paddle and go straight is you do like two paddles on one side, switch over, two paddles on the other, switch over, two on one side, and what you are essentially trying to do, and it doesn't matter whether you're trying to go fast or slow, you need to keep the speed of both sides of your canoe, your paddleboard, your kayak, you need to keep them the same speed. And so you could go fast on your paddleboard, or you could go slow on your paddleboard. But as long as the two sides are going the same speed, you will go straight. How do you turn the paddleboard? Well, one option is to always paddle on the same side. And so if I always paddle on my right, I'm essentially making the right side go a little bit faster. And so remember, that will be on the outside. So I will turn to the left. That will be the slow side. Another option is if I was already moving pretty fast, I could turn to my uh, left here. Instead of paddling on the right to make the right go faster, I could drag my paddle. I could even back paddle. And I could make my uh, left hand side go slower. So as long as my left hand side is going slower than my right side, I will turn towards the left. And then also it's true to go to the right. To go to the right, I can either paddle on my left to get, get more speed on my left, and so I can turn to the slower side. Or I can drag my paddle or back paddle on my right, and I'll, I'll turn to the right. And so the, the paddling is really a, a good example. Uh, if you've been in a marching band, kind of the same thing, they make a turn, you know, you have to learn that the people on the outside got to go really, really fast, and the people on the inside make this slow step around the corner in the marching band, whereas the people on the outside are running real fast, or at least kind of a half trot, in order to keep it going and keep it all in a, in a line. And so that's what I'm trying to illustrate to you, and I'm trying to point out that this bending then is not something special for light. Anytime there's a differential in speed, whether it's mechanics or light, there's a bending. And so that's why we have a bending. Uh, the reverse is also true when it comes out of the glass. So watch this picture. And so maybe the glass ends right here. Actually, maybe I'll give it a little more so I'm not on the whiteboard here or on the edge of that whiteboard. I'll, I'll do it here. But if this beam of light comes over to here, and of course, remember, they're cramped close together. Watch what happens right here. That edge is going to get out first. And if it gets out into a vacuum or air, it will now travel faster. And so it'll travel a little bit further than this one. Uh, that will spread out their wavelength. So as Ron said earlier, I'll spread those out. But the big thing I want to show you is then there would be a turn. And so if I had a dotted line here, perpendicular, and if I can use that word normal again. And so here's normal. I would say that I, I enter the glass, I am bending towards the normal. And as I am leaving, I am bending away from the normal. And I know that uh, you have a homework question that just kind of leaves a, a picture here and says, okay, as it enters the glass, will it look like this or will it look like that? And of course, to answer that, you're going to hopefully know something about the speed of light, that the speed of light gets reduced as it goes from the air into the glass. And so because you know its speed is reduced and because now you know its bending is caused by that speed differential, you're going to be able to predict which way it will bend. In fact, I think it gives you like five options. The first option is like no bending at all. Well, that's not true. The next one is towards the normal and the other one's away from the normal. Uh, maybe there's only three options. Uh, yeah, maybe that's just the three. But uh, you, hopefully, from this discussion I just had, will, can, can do that, that homework problem. Okay, okay, now I know which way it will bend. And I'm hoping then also you see that in, in my picture here, or in my real experiment here. Let me turn it quite a bit and power down the, the, the chalkboard lights here. And so if I were to draw a normal right here. I think you can see that it comes and it bends towards the normal. It bends towards the slower side. 
And if I imagine myself on the beam going this way, the slow side would be my left side. And so my left side would hit first, and I would bend then to my left. And that's what's happening right here. It's bending to my left. In fact, watch as I come out of the glass. As I move through the glass right here, I'll draw another normal where it's coming out. Okay, so there's a normal where it's coming out. And as I come out, again, the part on my left-hand side would come out first. And so as it comes out first, that would go fast. And so that means I'd bend to the right. And sure enough, it bends to the right, which would be away from the normal. So towards the normal as it's going in and away from the normal as it's, it's coming out. And so if you ever have a question, and I know you do on the homework, and you might on the test, I'm not sure I'm going to make the test here, but if they ask which way does it bend, that's the key to the problem. Look at how the speed is changing, and uh, that's which way it will, it will bend. So that again is the, the bending of light. Now, something interesting can kind of happen if you've ever looked at the bottom of a swimming pool. Uh, this bending of light, it's, it's not so obvious the light bends, but it's a good example of the, of the bending of light. Because a swimming pool would look something like this as you kind of look down into the, to the swimming pool. Um, let's say this is the bottom of the pool, and then here is the top of the, of the water. And I'll just keep it nice and level for simplicity. So let's just say nobody's in the swimming pool, so it's nice and calm water. And maybe there's something at the bottom. Many swimming pools have like that black line for when you're swimming, you, you, you know, you can follow it and make sure you're going in a straight line. And you go to look at the bottom of the swimming pool. Maybe you're wondering how, how deep is this pool? And you kind of decide how much you're going to jump or dive off the edge. And if you look, the light comes up. And then right here, it goes from the water into the air. Now, I'll exaggerate because it wouldn't bend that much, but there is a lot of bending in my picture, but there would be, again, if you're imagining you're traveling along a beam, and this is your left-hand side, your left-hand side is going to get out first, and that's where it's going to go faster, so it's going to curve over to the right, and there's going to be this bending. Now, remember how we said we get our depth perception? Remember we need the two rays? And so let's look at another beam. And so let's just say you're standing straight above the pool. So the other beam, and I'll, again, I'll exaggerate in my picture, would head off that way. And so you're, you're standing right over the pool. You're looking down. You're looking at this black marker. And the light comes up, and then it flares out. Now... It can't flare out much and still go to your eyes. But if you can imagine your eyes maybe further apart, this goes to your left eye, this goes to your right eye, your brain would calculate backwards saying, hey, this is where the light is coming from. And because of that, your brain would actually look like in your brain that the bottom of the pool is, is closer up. That's why we often say things underwater look magnified because they appear to be closer up to us. Um, which I guess is good because then you're going to look at that pool and, and, and think it's only uh, three feet deep when it's really maybe five feet deep. And so a lot of times people will jump in and go, okay, I'm just going to jump in and hit the bottom. And then they realize, whoa, wait, wait, whoa, whoa. And they go much deeper than they thought. Um, I'd say it's probably a good thing because sometimes people still dive in and... and uh, the, the bottom is actually deeper than it looks, so you know, hopefully they're trying not to hit the bottom. <laughs> and uh, so if they, if they know how deep it is or what they think is it, and then they, you know, try not to go three feet deep so they don't hit the bottom, and then, they, then it's really five feet deep, they're even less likely to, to hit the bottom. So that's kind of a help for humans not hitting the bottom of the, of the, of the pool here. But I said all that because I set up a block, and I think Ron can uh, get it... Uh, with the video camera, um, but down on the table near the front, I'll circle around up that way. Uh, I don't have a thing of water, but I have a glass block, and the glass block is sitting on a piece of paper with writing on it, so it'd be like the bottom of the pool here. And so if I kind of move this, I don't know, sideways or front and back, whichever is better, but I'm hoping you can see a difference between what the words look like here at the top. See, I take this off, this is just all words on the paper. There's no, there's no words on the glass block. 
but putting the glass block on top, it's like the words are in the glass and they come out and they got to do that same bending. They got to do that same refraction as it comes out towards you. And so what you, what you actually perceive of the light has been affected by this bending of the light. And so what I'm trying to get across in this first half of the chapter here is called refraction. Refraction is this bending of light. And I'm trying to t give you a reason of why there is a bending of light. So the, the two chapters tie together really well because last chapter we controlled the light by reflecting it. And we had a flat mirror and a concave mirror and a convex mirror. So in this chapter I'm going to say we're going to control the light by refracting it. And that refraction then can control the light and so we can build lenses. So instead of mirrors we have lenses. And so you're going to see here the same thing we can do with the mirrors we can now also do with the lenses. Instead of reflecting the light as we did in the last chapter we can refract the light. And so controlling the light by bending called refraction we can make images and we can make our images real or virtual bigger or smaller. All the things that we just did in chapter 7 teen tie over here to chapter 18. And so if you see that connection you'll, you'll see that this chapter I think is a little bit easier. Different, yes, but easy or even easier than the last one. Now there are of course things that are different about refraction than reflection. And one of them is this. This is, this is kind of really very interesting and very useful. If you start out in the air and go into glass, as I was just saying, you will always bend towards the normal. So that's not where the interesting thing's going to happen. But I wanted to show you the interesting thing does not happen when you go from the outside to the inside. And so if I do something like this, the light will then bend towards the normal. If I hit it 